Jay Baba, this is the 12th of our sessions in this series, uh, God Speaks as the Master Framework uh, for Meher Baba's Darshana. This week we're continuing uh, in chapter 8, or part 8 as it's called. This will be the third and the last session dealing with this very long chapter that runs from about page 75 to 153 or something. It's almost two-fifths of the entire book. And we're going to be dealing with the entire second half of uh, the chapter. In the uh, broad pattern we've been working with uh, has been uh, the divine theme as it gets retold through the course of God Speaks three times. Again, this chart here, Rano's chart, which I've used as a reference here, um, shows the divine theme, you know, from creation up here through evolution, reincarnation, then on the right-hand side, involution to God realization. Okay, well, in uh, the first 30 pages that we covered in the last two sessions, what underlay it was Baba's uh, treatment, uh, discussion of creation, evolution, up through reincarnation. Uh, in the sections we're going to be talking about today, uh, what, it will, Bob, what underlies Baba's discussion will be reincarnation, the planes of consciousness, and realization. But in this pass through the divine theme, this is the second in the course of God Speaks. And this time, he doesn't stop there. Uh, he adds something further to it, which we haven't seen before, which is uh, the theme of the four journeys. And I'll be explaining what that is. That is to say, he doesn't just take the story through to God realization. He also uh, explains what happens to those few souls who go further than that, who return to creation consciousness and who have a duty within creation. And then at the end, he brings in still another theme. That is the theme of the avatar. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Um, my reference is always to the second edition of God Speaks, uh, the third printing. Starting with the third printing, all the page numbers got changed. There's no other good way of referring to particular passages. So we're talking about, about page 105 through the end of the chapter, 153 or 152, whatever it is. The uh, divine theme uh, has these five elements, as in this slide, as I was uh, describing before. Um, and uh, in this portion of this chapter, again, Baba has underlying what his discussion, reincarnation, involution, the realization of God, and then the narrative of the four journeys. Uh, more broadly speaking, these are some of the topics uh, which Baba uses the narrative of the divine theme as a way of exploring. Uh, in the previous two sessions on the eighth chapter, we talked about the first of these, that is the everything and the nothing, uh, then the creation, the whim, and the own point. Uh, we talked about the triune nature of God as knowledge, power, and bliss, which is the basis for the mental, subtle, and gross spheres and bodies. Uh, the three conscious states of wakefulness, dream, and sound sleep, we talked about that last time, as we also did about God's uh, three aspects of creator, preserver, and destroyer. So as he's following through the divine theme in this second pass through the divine theme in chapter eight, Baba is using it as a uh, opening to show the role of these vast principles of cosmic architecture. Baba didn't talk about these things previously, but he's talking about it now. Okay, that's where we've gotten until this point. Now, these are gonna be some of the major topics 
uh, in the remainder of the chapter that will be our subject today. Life and experience in human form, that is to say, the reincarnationary cycle, where you go through 8,040,000 lifetimes in human form. Then involution and the journey through the planes. Um, after that, <clears throat> Baba doesn't exactly deal with these topics rigorously in this order, but broadly speaking, he does. He spends a good bit of attention on uh, the Sufi concepts of fana and baka, as you can see on the slide, fana and baka. That would be to say um, annihilation and abiding in. Through the course of talking about that, Baba brings in his explanation of the four journeys, which in brief are the journey from uh, the ordinary human state to God realization, from God realization to the return to creation consciousness, that's the second journey, from recreation consciousness to the assumption of duty as a perfect master, that's the third journey, and the fourth journey occurs when a perfect master drops his body and goes back to Nirvikalp Samadhi and is gone forever. Those are the four journeys. Um, and Baba also, in the course of talking about this, brings up um, various human types, human personalities, human roles. One of these has to do with the spiritual hierarchy. There is indeed a permanent hierarchy. Different people occupy these roles, but there are 7,000 offices in a hierarchy that governs the creation. Uh, and among these, there are what Baba calls Shivatmas. I put the word on the slide. Shivatma is a God-realized person. There are different types of these. And the uh, crowning the, the spiritual hierarchy, um, when he descends periodically, is the avatar of the age. And Baba concludes with that. Those, broadly speaking, are the topics in the remainder of this chapter. Okay, now, uh, coming back to uh, the beginning of our subject matter today, and uh, we're talking about um, starting about here on page 105, 106, 107, through about page 114. And I'm going to deal with this very briefly because this is a topic that has been explained before. Okay, starting on about page 105 of this chapter, Baba uh, has about eight or nine pages where he talks about reincarnation in human form in a very different way than he did before. But I'm going to deal with it very briefly because the essentials of it we've already covered. Much of what Baba has to say here uh, is that in human form, the soul, the jivatma, starts to experience the divine dream realistically and in full consciousness. Through evolution, the divine dream provided the basis for experience, but it was experienced subconsciously in kind of a dream state through the various forms, you know, worm, amoeba, bird, fish, uh, animal, and so forth, waking up more and more. In human form, you start to experience the divine dream realistically and vividly as if it were real. And Baba said, this is like a vacant dream into a dream because the divine dream is itself a dream, but then you're experiencing it as if it were real which is itself a dream within a dream. You're imputing reality to something which is not real at all. So Baba has a lot to say about that in this section. The uh, creation that we experience, Baba uh, re emphasizes, is a manifestation of nothingness. It comes out of nothing. It is the nothingness that comes out of the nothing. And in human form, 
you experience it as if it were the everything, as if it were the reality, as if it were God. Uh, so you come to the complete experience of falseness in human form. In human form, we're at the stage of greatest distance uh, from God in the sense we've, ac we've acquired full consciousness. Remember when God had the whim, who am I? To answer that question, God had to become conscious. Well, now in human form, God in me is conscious, but I'm experiencing falsely. I'm attributing reality to something which is nothing. That's the great tragic irony. So Baba explains that point a bit here. Here's another point that's worth looking at uh, on this uh, page. In other words, God becomes infinitely absorbed in his own infinitely perfect image, intently seeking his infinity. That is to say, God as the soul is seeking his own infinite self, but he gets absorbed in his own perfect image. What is that perfect image? Human form. The human form is the perfect image of God. So now this is a great theme in some of the religious traditions where the Bible says that uh, man was created in the image of God. And elsewhere, in fact, later in God Speaks, Baba does say that the human form is latent in every form within creation. There is no other form. Every form is the human form compacted and compressed. But when you achieve, uh, when evolution is complete and you start to incarnate as a human being, the human form is fully manifested. And at this stage then, God becomes infinitely absorbed in his own perfect image, intently seeking his infinity. <clears throat> and although God does gain full consciousness through it, through the medium of this form, he does not realize the reality of his own eternal infinite existence in it. But the instant the full consciousness thus gained ceases to identify God with the infinite reflection of his own perfect, his infinitely perfect image, this image vanishes from the consciousness of God and God spontaneously and automatically and consciously realizes his own identity of God as God. So this is what we have to do. God in us has to stop identifying with God's image as our human form. And the instant that's gone, the uh, God in me realizes himself as God. And that's the remainder of the story through the course of um, in the evolutionary journey. Okay. Um, Moving to on a few pages, by the way, here's a chart <clears throat> which summarizes some of what we've seen so far. I won't go into it in great depth, but you can see on the left hand side here that uh, Baba is showing the, the Atma, the soul's evolution from stone to man. And notice that this is drawn as if to look like a seven, right? because there are seven stages in the evolutionary descent. And then in human form, the jivatma, the drop soul, progresses through the seven planes. And here you see something else that looks like a seven, where the divine theme is completed and the uh, jivatma has, becomes a shivatma and has the I am God experience. So there's a certain parallelism between evolution and involution, involution occurring through the course of these seven planes. Now, in, these, uh, in this section, in these pages around here, um, Baba starts to review the journey, involutionary journey through the seven planes, through the four planes of the subtle sphere, the first to the third, really. The fourth is at the juncture between the subtle sphere and the mental. And he talks about the journey through the mental sphere, fifth and sixth plane to the seventh. And I'm going to um, pass, deal with this in just a few words also, because this is very much 
a recapitulation of chapter 5, which we already had a session on. In fact, one of the, uh, much of it repeats chapter 5 word for word or close to it. So this is the same fundamental content where Baba is describing each of these planes, again with an extensive warning about the dangers of the fourth plane. Okay, so I think that's enough on that. And now we'll get to um, some of the really new material in this chapter. At the end of his review of the, of the involutionary journey through the planes, up to the seventh plane, Baba brings in uh, two major Sufi terms, fana and baka, fana and baka, F-A-N-A and B-A-Q-A. Um, Baba had been using these terms since the 1920s. They play an important role in many of his explanations. And these are big terms in uh, Sufism. You can find a lot of discussion about this in the Sufi literature. What these are <coughs> is um, fana means a passing away or an annihilation. And baka is an abiding in. And uh, broadly speaking in Sufism and in Baba's accounts also, what they designate is this. When you're in making a spiritual journey, let's say the involutionary journey, when you transcend a certain stage of consciousness, it gets annihilated. You pass away from it. You experience a death or a sound sleep, so to speak. Um, and the next stage, that's the fana, and the next stage is when you enter into the higher plane and you start to abide in it. You have the baka of the higher plane. So fana is the annihilation and baka is the abiding in the next uh, level in progress. This is basic concepts. Now Bob is going to develop this a lot but where he first brings this up uh, is uh, at the moment of uh, God realization. Let me, so in this um, slide here, this is page 125, this passing away in the absolute vacuum of the original state of God is called attaining the fana of the seventh plane of consciousness. In Sufi terms, fana means passing away in. Fana has two stages. The first stage of fana is the conscious experience of the absolute vacuum state. And the second stage of fana, or fana fila, is the conscious experience of the I am God state. Okay, so now th let's unpack this. This is... Uh, a little bit um, new. Uh, so fana, there's fana and fana fila. Fana fila is Arabic. It's fana fi ala, fana in God. The first um, stage, simple fana, is the same thing as nirvana. Baba explained that the Buddhist, when Buddha spoke about nirvana, he was actually talking about this, the experience of the infinite divine vacuum. This is the first, the immediate preliminary to God realization. When all your sanskaras are gone, when all the manifestations of nothingness disappear, you experience the infinite divine vacuum. Now there are some contradictory statements on this, but there's something in the supplement where he says you experience the divine nothing. And Baba has a, a bit on this, on the two pages beyond on page 127, where Baba talks about uh, nirvana. The experience of the first stage of fana is of the nirvana state. Nirvana is that state where apparently 
God is not. This is the only state where God is not and consciousness is. That is to say, everything has disappeared, but God has not yet appeared to you. So Baba says, in this state, God plays the role of consciousness. Reading on, this experience of the first stage of Fana is what Buddha emphasized, but later on it was misinterpreted as Buddha having emphasized that there was no God. The reality, however, is that God is, but in the absolute vacuum state of the first stage of Fana, only consciousness remains experiencing absolute vacuum. Okay, so now this is the simple fana, but it is followed in many cases instantaneously by fana fila, or uh, nirvakalp samadhi would be a Hindu term for it. Nirvakalp means uh, without any doubt, samadhi without any doubt. And in this state, the soul experiences I am God, aham brahmasmi, anilhak. So that's fana to fana fila. These are the two stages. And uh, Baba did, does say here and in the supplement to God Speaks, you'll find this, um, that when you, if you experience the fana or, nirva, or nirvana uh, and die in that state, you see, once you've had this experience, you don't have any use for the body or the world anymore. It's disappeared for you. It never did exist at all. It's nothing. And it's out of your experience. So whether you die or not makes no difference at all. But if you do die while you're still in the nirvana state, then <clears throat> after death, you get the experience of infinite bliss. Mukti is the word for it. Uh, but if while still in the body, nirvana is followed by nirvakalp samadhi, you get full God realization with the experience of infinite knowledge, power, bliss. You may recall from an earlier session, those are the triune nature of God, knowledge, power, bliss. So this, these are the two aspects of fana. Um, this chart at the back of God Speaks uh, shows this. This is chart 11. Uh, it may be a little hard to see in this version of it, uh, but up on the, if you can see here in the right uh, center, it says nirvana, absolute vacuum state nirvana, right above that bold black line. That's the final fana. Uh, Baba also used the word mananash to designate this. This is another term for it. And right beyond it is the I am God state, anilhak, nirvakalpa, over on the left here you can see, uh, nirvakalpa, nirvakalpa samadhi, um, aham brahmasmi is the famous mahavakya, Upanishadic expression for that, nirvakalpa samadhi. Okay. So fana has two stages. The first is fana or nirvana or mananash, where everything disappears and you experience divine vacuum. And the next stage is um, the uh, fana fila, where you have the I am God experience. That's fana. But now what the baka is relative to this. So now we turn from fana to baka. And baka designates um, an abiding in. Uh, and the movement from fana to baka in Sufism is characterized as an upward movement where you pass through the annihilation of the lower state that you are in. Uh, and after that in fana, that annihilation, you enter into the higher state that follows it. Uh, Baba's going to use the terms in these ways in a minute, as I'll be getting to. Uh, but the final fana, which has two parts, as I've been saying, uh, nirvana and nirvakalp samadhi, culminates in the I am God state. The baka that follows it, for those rare souls, those rare beings who have this destiny, is the return to creation consciousness 
and living the life of God within creation. Uh, now, here's uh, a, a chart um, that is helpful in understanding this. This is the 10 states of God chart. Um, the fana is the eighth, fanafila is the eighth state of God where you have the I am God experience, right? And that's um, uh, followed by those with this destiny by uh, the ninth state of God, the divine junction. And right after the uh, passing the divine junction, you see number nine here, Roman numeral nine at the, near the center, at the center near the top, uh, is the experience of full creation consciousness. That's baka, baka bila. So fana, uh, fila, and baka bila, fana in God and baka in God. These are uses of the term that Baba gave to it. Of course, in Islam, uh, in Orthodox Islam, um, the idea of the possibility of union with God uh, would not broadly be accepted. Now, actually, Baba, this is the highest fana, um, and, the, and Baba begins his discussion of fana and baka with this, with their nirvana state and uh, nirvakalp samadhi. But Baba says that there are three kinds of fana and baka, and this slide shows that. Um, there's the fana, uh, ordinary fana and baka, the fana of subhumans and gross conscious humans, that's the first. The second is the fana of pilgrims on the path, that is in the involutionary path. And the third is fana fila, which we've just been talking about, we've already covered that. Now, it turns out that every soul from stone, the beginning of evolution in stone all the way through gross conscious uh, human experience uh, involves the daily experience of fana and baka. Fana is going to sleep. That's ordinary fana. And baka is waking up from that ordinary sound sleep state to your ordinary awake state. Um, so animals, insects, worms, even stones apparently have this experience, as do gross conscious people. Babas here appears to be making a connection between the Sufi concepts of fana and baka and the states of sound sleep and wakefulness, which as we saw last week, uh, are central to Vedanta and central to Meher Baba's darshana also. This is connecting the Islamic background with the Vedantic background, uh, which seems to me to be something new. Uh, now, <clears throat> that's the ordinary fana baka. So you see these ultimate states of, you know, nirvana and nirvakalp samadhi and so forth um, are prefigured, are foreshadowed in ordinary experience of every jivatma throughout the entire spiritual journey. But this, uh, that, the second kind of fana and baka is that experienced by pilgrims on the involutionary path to God. And this is about pages 131 to 135 in this second edition, third printing, if you have that edition with those page numbers. And uh, I have to say that this is very confusing, and I won't try to go into the depths of it. It seems contradictory in a number of places. In some places, Baba seems to be saying that it's the fana on the plains is going to sleep and the baka is waking up, same as the other one was. Um, so I, I won't try to resolve all of that. But he, <clears throat> there seems to be this fundamental difference, that on the plains, the, there is a movement involved, a movement in consciousness from spheres. All the way until then, even in evolution, um, you're ha passing away and you're then returning to abide, but it's always within the gross sphere. You haven't shifted your fundamental place of experience. But on the path, you pass away and emerge into something higher. Uh, now, 
There is much more on this in uh, some of Baba's other publications. I would particularly recommend something which most people are not aware of, and that is a series of uh, uh, drafts of uh, um, Baba's discourses published by Dr. Abdul Ghani in the Mira Baba Journal, 1941-1942, where he talks a lot about the fana and the baka of the planes. And with each plane, apparently, like if I'm going from the first plane to the second, there's a passing away where my previous experience of the first plane is annihilated. And there's a baka where I enter into and experience and abide in this, the experience of the second plane. That happens between each of the planes from gross up to the sixth plane. And then at the sixth plane, you have the final fana, the real fana with a capital F, which is nirvana, nirvakalp, samadhi, and so forth. So this is Baba's treatment of fana baka in God Speaks, which starts, I don't know, one, page 125, and he keeps bringing this up for, for uh, quite a few pages here. Okay, let's move on <clears throat> now to the uh, next topic, which is actually related to this. This uh, topic, um, which comes up in the last, in the same section actually, uh, is, uh, goes by the name The Four Journeys. Baba uh, gave his final development, final form of this in God Speaks, in this section of God Speaks. Baba actually gave a discourse on this very topic at the East West Gathering in 1962. And there's a very nice summary version of it to be found in the book published in 1963, The Everything and the Nothing. Um, this particular chart in God Speaks, The Four Journeys, uh, represents it. You'll find the very same thing in The Everything and the Nothing. Now, The Four Journeys is a significant extension beyond the divine theme. I've been harping on the divine theme until now. But the story of the divine theme is the, journey, the narrative of the soul's journey from uh, the original awakening uh, with the whim of God to God realization. The four journeys takes us beyond that. Um, and uh, these, the four journeys are these. <clears throat> On this slide. The first journey is from gnosis, the term Baba uses, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, means knowledge, but he uses it to refer to actual spiritual knowledge of the planes of consciousness. So, and you start to experience gnosis when you enter the spiritual path, going beyond the gross sphere into the first plane. So the first journey is from the beginning of gnosis, the entry, entry into the path, to fana phila, the realization of God, right? We've just been talking about that. Nirvakalp samadhi, the I am God state. So from ordinary go gross conscious human experience to God realization is the first journey. The second journey is from fana phila to baka bila, or getting established in the life of God as God. Um, and uh, we've already said a little bit about this. This entails, uh, and when you have fanathila, the universe is gone for you. It does not exist for you. It actually doesn't exist at all. So you don't experience it at all. But in baka bila, the universe and creation returns and you are fully conscious of it once again. The third journey, that's baka bila. Someone who has achieved this is called a jivan mukta, a jivan mukta, and the ninth state of God. The third journey is from this, baka bila, to this Islamic term is kutubiyat. Uh, that's the state of a kutub or sadguru or perfect master. Now, in kutubiyat, or sadguru ship, you could say, or perfect masterhood. Uh, when you complete the journey, the third journey, you enter into 
that state. And the difference between that and Bakabila is um, now one has taken on duty, a duty within creation. You have a circle and you have responsibility towards the creatures in creation. After the second uh, journey to Bakabila, you're conscious of the universe, but you don't have any responsibility and you don't have a job. The third journey makes you a perfect master of whom there are always five, exactly five at all times in the universe. And uh, after the perfect master dies, drops his physical body, he returns to Nirvakalp Samadhi, the individualized experience of the I am God state. That's the fourth journey. And a perfect master is gone forever. Um, never returns and has nothing more to do with creation. The avatar is different from this. So now, in this, um, uh, I'll show the one from God Speaks. Here is a depiction of the four journeys in this chart. Uh, you can see at the bottom here the infinite gross sphere, which Baba says has millions of universes. Now, when Baba was saying this, uh, astrophysics um, had not yet dreamt the idea that there could be more than one universe. Now it's a standard trope within astrophysics. But Baba had been saying this since the 1920s. Okay, so you see from the bottom here the gr infinite gross universe. You see the subtle world, the mental world, and these braces here. The seventh plane, Fana, um, and uh, when you have achieved this final fana, which means actually fana fila, that's the completion of the first journey. Now, the second journey, as shown here, is from there to abiding in God, baka, as man and God experiences infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. Um, but you also, in Bakabila, have the full experience of the universe. That's the second journey where you arrive at the state of actually a Jivan Mukta in the ninth state of God. Now the third journey, as shown in this chart, as you can see, uh, arrives at the state of Kutubiyat, uh, the, the experience of the perfect masters of whom there are always five, living God's life, um, both as man and God simultaneously. And in the fourth journey, one the perfect master dies and passes away. God drops his physical, subtle, and mental vehicles and experiences infinite power, knowledge, and bliss while retaining infinite individuality. That's the end. That's the same state, basically, as a Majub was in. But uh, in the second, third, and fourth journeys, those people have a role to play within creation, and they play it. Here's another chart very useful for illustrating all of this, and that is the ten states of God. I mean, I keep returning to this because it's such a major chart. The first journey <clears throat> is from the sixth state of God, if you can see that down at the bottom center, human state, and that journey begins when you enter into the path and then on the left here, you go through the gross, subtle, and mental worlds. This is the um, a seventh state of God. Up to eight, God is divinely absorbed. Once you've achieved that, you've completed the first journey. The second journey is from eight over across. You see where nine is there? That's the divine junction. When you've crossed past the divine junction, you are established in Baka Bila. And uh, the persons who have done that are called Jivan Muktas. The third journey is from there, just past number nine. Do you see number 10 here? Uh, this is the state of the perfect master. It's also the state, the role, the office of the uh, uh, avatar also. We're not talking about the avatar just now. Uh, and when you've taken up a duty with a circle and responsibility uh, for creation, um, you've completed the third journey. And in the fourth journey, you go back from 10 to 8 again, and you're out of it. 
you have nothing more to do with any kind of responsibility within creation. So I'm going to read through some of these slides. The first journey begins with gnosis, the gnosis one experiences in entering the spiritual path. It concludes in the fana phila or nirvakalp samadhi of the seventh plane, wherein one passes away in God and God experiences the realization of self. Now, Baba gives precise names for the individuals who have done this. The one who completes the first journey is a majub or brahmibut. Majub is a Islamic, Arabic, Sufi term, and brahmibut is a Hindu term. In majubiyat, in the eighth state of God, he experiences knowledge, power, bliss, but remains oblivious to the universe. And we happen to have a photograph of such an individual. It's this man here, Chacha. So uh, you can sort of see it when you look at him. He is very conscious, but he's not conscious of us. The universe does not exist for him at all. This is a majub. Uh, most people just die, drop their bodies, but there are a few who have the role of living in their bodies, even though they're not conscious of their bodies and they're not conscious of the creation. The second journey begins in Fana Phila, or Sahaj Samadhi would be a Vedantic term for it, and concludes in Baka Bila, Atma Pratistapana is the Hindu term Baba gives for this, wherein one becomes established in the life of God with normal consciousness. The rare one who completes the second journey is a Salik in Sulukiyat. I'll be coming to that uh, term, those terms in a minute. Such a one has passed beyond the station of Turiya Avasta in the ninth state of God. It's just past the ninth state of God. A Salik, or this would be a Jivan Mukta, not only experiences, but Baba says, accumulates knowledge, power, bliss, but he does not use them. Now, this is some, a topic which people can puzzle on. And what does it mean to accumulate knowledge, power, bliss? Apparently, they're part of your storehouse. But in the, uh, those in, who have completed the second journey don't use it. They just watch and, you know, enjoy the show. And if you meet them, they help you. But they don't have a fundamental duty to creation. Now, the third journey begins in the Salukiyat of Baka Bila uh, and concludes in Kutubiyat. Salukiyat and Kutubiyat are, of course, Islamic Sufi terms wherein one simultaneously lives the life of God and man. So you're actually living the life of God and man. In the, after the second journey, you're not living the life. Um, you're conscious of it all. But now you live the life. The very, rare, very, very rare one who completes the third journey becomes a perfect master, Sadguru Kutub. Those are the names that, uh, you know, Sadhguru is a Hindu name, Kutub is Islamic. Such a one is established in the tenth state of God. Unlike the Salik in Salukiyat, that's someone who's completed the second journey, the Sadhguru uses knowledge, power, bliss, as well as weakness and suffering for those still in bondage. And the fourth journey occurs when the Kutub, drops his bodies, grows subtle and mental, all three of them he drops, and passes away as God, retaining eternally the experience of conscious, infinite, individual, indivisible individuality. Such a one remains consciously and individually as God in the I am God state of Fana Phila. So those are the four journeys. <clears throat> I think it's... Um, you know, I feel that the world will be benefited by this understanding, uh, by realizing that there are different kinds of God-realized people. Uh, some are conscious of the creation and some are not. Uh, to some, the creation does not exist for them. Some are conscious of the creation, but, you know, if you go to such a person, uh, 
I'm being a little facetious here, they'll say, and for help, they'll say, I sympathize with your problem. The perfect master is over there. You need someone who's taken on duty within creation, and there are only five of those. So these are the different kinds of uh, God-realized persons, and the term for that is a Shiv Atma, a Shiv Atma. A Jeev Atma is a person, um, is a drop soul, uh, anywhere from the beginning of evolution in stone all the way through a six-plane saint. Those are all Jeev Atmas. But when you realize God, the term for a good generic term for all kinds of God-realized persons is a Shivatma. And these are the fundamental different types of Shivatmas. Okay, <clears throat> the next uh, topic, um, I'm just going to mention here without going into it, uh, this, in this very long chapter, from about pages uh, 143, let me pull it up here. From about here, about 143 or so, for about four pages, um, you can see here the original state is the beyond, beyond state of God, etc. Baba loops back to the beginning of his story again and talks about the original beyond, beyond state, evolution, reincarnation, involution. Um, he reviews that. And as I said in previous sessions, this is a characteristic of God Speaks. Time and again, Baba will get to a certain point in his narrative, and then he'll sort of say, how did we get here? And he'll spiral back, he'll loop back and review the stages by which you came to that point. So he does this for three or four pages. Um, last time we were talking about uh, how the, what we experience as the present is actually the past presenting itself as we're, at pre we're the present. This technique of Baba's in God Speaks reminds me of that. It's sort of showing how the past comes back into the present again. It's happened a number of times in God Speaks. And to tell the truth, it seems to me to be a distinctive characteristic of God Speaks. I don't see this in other books of Baba's. But it happens here again. And actually, here on page 46, uh, Baba uh, goes back to the original ocean drop analogy that we saw in the very first chapter. Uh, I won't read it here, but you can see it up on the screen, page 146. He actually repeats some of the content of part one, the first chapter, word for word, about how the uh, Atma is not only in Paramatma, but the Atma is Paramatma. The drop is not only in the ocean, the drop is the ocean. We saw that in the very first chapter, and he repeats it uh, word for word. Um, so there are a couple pages on this. But now I'll come to the last major topic, uh, which seems to crown this chapter. Uh, it begins on about page 135 or so. And this is talking about the different kinds of spiritually advanced souls, the spiritual hierarchy, the perfect masters, and the avatar. And uh, one distinction which Baba clarifies is that between a suluk and a majub. Um, a salik is actually the uh, sulukiyat is the name of the state and salik is the name of a person in that state. And a majub uh, is the designation. Okay, we've seen a majub who's God realized. On a lower level, a majub is someone who is so overpowered by his experience that he becomes drunk and loses balance and becomes unconscious of his external environment. This does remind me of fana a little bit. Maybe it's someone who's overpowered by fana. But uh, one who recovers from this, regains balance, and... Uh, experiences the ordinary world from whichever plane he's on um, is a salik. And 
a, a salik can look like an ordinary person. Uh, you, uh, a salik could converse with you ordinarily, could uh, um, walk, hold a job, uh, do ordinary tasks. Okay, so that's a majub, and uh, another term Baba used for these individuals on the plains is a must. A must is overpowered or intoxicated. A salik who has a, achieved balance and poise uh, can look like an ordinary man or woman. Um, you wouldn't know that this person is on the plains, but they are. So this fundamental distinction is there, uh, which was very central to Baba's work. He did all this work with the musts, as recorded in the Wayfarers, and the Wayfarers explains much more about this. But God Speaks gives us a basic um, uh, discussion of this, and Baba actually says there are musts, and there are majubs and saliks, and there are people who... Um, do both. Sometimes are intoxicated and sometimes balanced. If they're more intoxicated than balanced, they're majub saliks. And if they're more balanced than uh, intoxicated, they're salik majubs. Uh, this is another type. And Baba explicitly compares this or draws the connection between this and in the Ten States of God chart here, the majub on the plains has an, a likeness to the Eighth State of God. Uh, the salik is like the Ninth or Tenth State of God. And um, the one in between is in the state of what Baba called the Divine Junction. The, there are God-realized souls who sometimes experience I am God and sometimes experience I am human. That's the divine junction at the ninth state of God. So there are people on the path who show the, these same characteristics on a lower level. Now, Baba says that always, um, at all times, there are, of course, five perfect masters, and there are 56 God-realized persons. Um, my understanding of this is 56 offices um, where they, there's like a body, a hierarchy um, of people who have some kind of role to play. There's much more I could say about this, but I would have to go to Tiffin lectures and other books to say more about it. In addition, there are 7,000 offices, I'm using that term, uh, comprising what Baba calls a spiritual hierarchy. 7,000 people with these offices who are responsible for governing the affairs of the universe. Um, so if you don't like the state of the universe, file your complaint with the spiritual hierarchy. I don't think most of us gross conscious people get a vote in the matter, but we could always wail and complain. So there is in fact a body uh, bodies governing the affairs of the universe, and they are presided over by the five perfect masters, uh, of whom one is the chief. The term Baba uses, for a Sufi term, is the Kutub i Irshad. The Kutub i Irshad is the head of the five perfect masters. Uh, when Baba, w before Baba became God, realized the Kutub i Irshad was Sai Baba of Sherdi. Uh, when the avatar is uh, in body and performing his mission, the Kutubi Irshad steps down from his office. But after the avatar drops his body, there's a new Kutubi Irshad, so there would be one now. Um, so these five perfect masters are again in this uh, 10 states of God chart. Here they are, they're the 10th state of God depicted there. Actually, the tenth state of God can also be the avatar. And this chapter concludes with a uh, discussion of the relation and difference between a perfect master and the avatar. There are three or four pages, 
And the last two are a really quite a magnificent uh, characterization of who the avatar is. Now, remember we said the four journeys was added on to the uh, divine theme. Well, actually, the avatar doesn't go through the four journeys. These would be, uh, these journeys are passed through by souls who came up from creation, became God realized, became perfect masters. The avatar differs first in this respect. Um, he doesn't <clears throat> pass through the whole journey of creation to become an avatar. Um, in fact, uh, the avatar directly descends from God's state to man's state. And this happens uh, at the instance of the five perfect masters who draw a perfect, the God down into human form. The five of them pull him down to incarnate in a male human form as the avatar. Um, whereas a perfect master ascends. It's a bottom-up. So Avatar is top-down deal. Um, and thus, uh, the, a perfect uh, master is man become God, whereas the Avatar is God become man. And that is related to the other major difference, uh, which Baba explains here. He said that a perfect master acts and the avatar becomes. Um, and he gave us an illustration of this. When a perfect master appears to be sick, he's actually acting the role of a sick human being perfectly. But when the avatar becomes sick, he actually becomes sick. Um, and this has to do with the fact that the avatar becomes everything and everyone. The perfect master doesn't do this, but the avatar, Baba said, is like he's an ant to an ant, a bear to a bear, a man or human being to a human being. He actually descends and becomes everything and everyone within creation. Um, the perfect master has the knowledge of this and does infinite service to the universe, but nothing can match the service performed by the avatar by virtue of becoming everything. So the last few pages of this chapter uh, do uh, develop on this idea a lot. So I'll conclude... Uh, this session with reading a few snippets from the last two pages. Uh, this is on page 152. Thus it is that God is man, proclaiming himself as the avatar, suffers himself to be persecuted and tortured, to be humiliated and condemned by humanity, for whose sake his infinite love has made him stoop so low. Okay, jumping. The avatar is always one and the same because God is always one and the same. The eternal, indivisible, infinite one who manifests himself in the form of a man as the avatar, the Messiah, as the prophet, as the Buddha, as the ancient one, the highest of the high. So, uh, you know, some of our great world religions are based on avataric advents. Jesus, Buddha, Mohammed, Krishna, Ram, Zoroaster. Those are the ones that Baba mentioned the most often, but there have been a great many. Uh, the avatar comes down and manifests and expresses himself according to the language and understanding and needs of the time, adjusting himself accordingly. Uh, Baba here says that when the avatar uh, assumes his office, the Kutubi Irshad, the head of the five perfect masters, uh, relinquish, ceases to hold this divine office and uh, retires for the time being. But when the avatar drops his body, then a new perfect master assumes that role. In spite of the advent of the avatar, there must be 
56 God-realized ones in human body. So the avatar is in addition to the 56 and in addition to the five perfect masters and in addition to the 7,000 in the spiritual hierarchy. The 7,001. It really is 7,000 exactly in the hierarchy. Um, and from amongst these 56, there must be five perfect masters living on earth. When one from amongst these five perfect masters drops his physical body, the office is never left vacant. It is invariably filled by another living God-realized one who has realized the eternal reality at the time. Hence, even when the avatar is on earth, there are 56 God-realized ones, including the five perfect masters in human form, but the avatar becomes the sole authority. So this chapter has then arrived at, culminated, and concluded with the topic of the avatar. So that's part eight, chapter eight, uh, a major uh, pass through the divine theme and other things also, uh, as we've seen, uh, the most difficult part of God Speaks uh, and uh, a very, very deep treatment of many of these topics. So next time, we will be moving on from the 8th chapter to the ninth, which is entitled The Ten States of God, and we'll spend just one session on it. But in my opinion, that chapter, The Ten States of God, is the most important single enunciation of Meher Baba's darshana to be found anywhere. And it actually is based on a chart that Baba began the book with. This was the starting point of the book God Speaks. That will be next time. Okay, so that's all for today. And let's close with the Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai.